website. So I'm doing this uh, training for companies. And uh, I'm also a Russia and CIS business consultant. So uh, me and my team at Sarus Oy, we're doing market surveys, partner search, say, help in sales negotiations and contract making in, uh, in Russia and CIS countries. I have uh, worked with Russia for more than 20 years, mainly in SME business. So I have quite an extensive experience in uh, these practical questions also about, about Russia business. And uh, actually I have also uh, lived as an expat and worked in, as an expat in Russia and also Kazakhstan. Okay, Lisa, please introduce yourself as well. Hi, <clears throat> good morning from the, from the US. I apologize for my voice. I have a cold, but I hope you can hear me okay. Um, my name is Lisa DeWard. As they said, I'm a former professor of linguistics and cross-cultural communication in the United States, uh, specializing in Russia and Russian linguistics. And I recently came on board as associate partner with Hofstede Insights, continuing my work in cross-cultural communication from a different perspective now, helping businesses as they manage the impact of culture. Um, Pia and I have been preparing this webinar for the past couple of months, and we're very excited to welcome you and um, are excited to see that there are so many that are interested in the topic of cultural intelligence, which we know from the research is so important now in this ever globalizing world. And so we are looking forward to sharing some insights with you. We're going to focus on the 6D national culture model from Hofstede about Russia, briefly talk to you a little bit about that. And then we're going to move on to some very practical insights about how you go about getting connections in Russia to set up a meeting and to um, begin negotiations. And we chose meetings and negotiations because these were requested by members of the Cuban community. And so we hope that um, this will be very helpful for you and look forward to answering any questions you might have at the end. Okay, thanks Lisa. So now I think so. We'll get to the business then. Um, I'll move this slide. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So uh, let's talk about briefly about Russian market and the Eurasian Economic Union. Actually, when you're considering Russia as your target market, you should remember that uh, Russia is the central state in the former Soviet Union with business and cultural ties with all those, all or most, let's say most of the former Soviet Union countries, because we all know that there are some political issues between some, some countries. But uh, Russia as a part of uh, uh, Eurasian Economic Union is actually giving you an access to market of about 183 million people and many companies use it uh, as their base in all their efforts in, in the business in this region. <clears throat> but what do you need? What do you need in all business with Russia and with any other, other countries is trust. Because if you want to make any business transactions, they are usually based on trust. And uh, we should all understand that trust is not a universal concept. Who you trust, uh, who, uh, who thinks that you are trustworthy. It's a very complex issue. And uh, it affects ways of communication, workplace etiquette, meeting etiquette, organizational hierarchies, etc. And uh, later when we talk about uh, individualism and co collectivism, Actually, we also refer to this uh, trust issue in a way that actually general trust is more uh, our, uh, let's say, concept or value in the individualistic countries in Western Europe. And uh, 
I would say that in Russia and most uh, and actually all uh, collectivistic uh, countries, it's more assurance-based trust. So uh, what it means in practice is that uh, uh, we, for example, Finns usually uh, we trust everybody unless they prove that they can't be trusted. And uh, let's say Russians usually trust people who they already know or have engaged with, uh, or somebody who they trust tells you that they, you can trust this person, for example. So there are differences in these things, but anyway, in all business transactions, trust is a, one of the key factors in, in the success. So um, you are here to improve your cultural skills and want to perform better with Russians. So it means that you should be culturally savvy or you ha should have a high cultural intelligence. What kind of person are you when you are culturally savvy? You usually understand the differences between individual or group behavior. And uh, group behavior here is the cultural behavior. So it means that kind of the, the way we do things here, it's the dominant culture of the right behavior. You're also open-minded, you're aware of differences, you accept that there are cultural differences, but you're not biased, you don't judge. And then you are, in the end, adaptable and capable of building trust in different cultures. We prepared uh, two small case studies for this session. I'm reading them now aloud to you. The managing director, MD, of a small European SME is happy that a Russian distributor found their website and asked to become their representative in Russia. The Russians also invited them to visit, but the managing director would like them to place an order first to see if they are serious, because the trip to Moscow is not so cheap for an SME. Okay, then we have another one. A Swedish boss briefly met a staff member by the coffee machine in their St. Petersburg office and decided to ask her to take an important, uh, on, an, on an important project. The staff member promised to do it. However, the next time they met, she had done almost nothing. Okay. These are now the things uh, that, uh, well, let's say these are two real life situations for you. And please keep them in mind when Lisa will next uh, explain you Russian culture and values through the Hofstede 6D model. Yes, thank you, Pia. So those two case studies that we've prepared we want you to keep them in mind as I go through the, what we're going to call on this slide, the six basic dilemmas of culture. So the national dimensions based on Hofstede's work. And at the end of my discussion of the, um, of the dimensions, Pia and I will return to the case studies and we'll give you an analysis of how these cultural issues came about in the case studies and the advice we would give as consultants on how to resolve these issues going forward. So um, all of you having signed up for a Cube In webinar, um, maybe have seen the Hofstede work before. Um, Hofstede looks at cultural differences through the lens of six basic dilemmas. So we have six different dimensions along which each culture has a specific score based on research that has been um, statistically verified and replicated, and we can talk about that if there are more questions at the end. But um, for now, I'm going to go on to what the dimensions are. So the first is hierarchy versus equality. How does a culture handle inequality? Individualism versus collectivism. Performance versus caring. Uncertainty avoidance versus letting it be. Flexibility versus discipline and indulgence versus restraint. So we're going to go through these 
Sophia, can you give me the? I'm sorry, I couldn't do it, so I'll. Okay. It didn't work. Okay. Sorry Thank for you. the technical problem. So, in Russia, these are the scores that Russia would have. We'll notice that we have very high power distance, low individualism, which means high collectivism. And again, I'm going to go into these um, in more what these mean in more detail in a moment. Low masculinity, which does not need to be interpreted as a trait of men or women. This is whether or not you are interested, more motivated by competition and achievement, or more motivated by quality of life and caring for others. Uncertainty avoidance, one of the highest scores that we have is for Russia. Long-term orientation is high and indulgence is very low. So in the next slide, Oh, I have it now, great. Thank you, you have it. I do, okay. So I've compared Finland with Russia, and then on the next slide, I'll compare Germany with Russia, just so you can see the difference in scores. So when we look at these scores, they're useful in comparison to one another. And anytime you see a difference of more than 10 points, you're going to feel this cultural difference in interaction. So as you can see, the Finns and the Russians very different in power distance, um, very different in every one of the dimensions, closer in masculinity than in the other dimensions, but still a difference of 10 points. So a Finnish person and a Russian person in interaction would feel all of these different cultural differences. Another country um, in, in Western Europe that has a different profile from Finland and a different profile from Russia is Germany. Again, very high differences all on all of the dimensions except for long-term orientation. So let's figure out exactly what each of these, it's not letting me advance the slide. Okay, what each of these dimensions mean. So power distance, Russia has one of the highest scores for power distance. This means that hierarchy is accepted and viewed as normal and good. So this means that the people in the society that have less power accept that that is a normal and good thing because they have a different relationship to the power holders and the power holders have a different relationship to them than in a country that has a lower score like Finland where everyone is viewed more or less as having um, similar amounts of power. Uh, rank and status are going to affect all of your business endeavors in Russia is going to have very, very practical um, consequences for meetings and negotiation and all of your business. Pia will talk about that, the details of that later on. Subordinates are going to defer to their boss. The boss is supposed to look after their needs. So we have a relationship in which each is giving something important and each is receiving something important. So Russians, um, Russia's score for individualism is very low, which means it has a strong preference for collectivism. This means that you have an in-group that you belong to, that is the core around which your daily life centers. And typically it's extended family, close friends, smaller number of close friends, very, very close. And the individual has a responsibility to the group and primarily to their in-group. They are to show loyalty, to sacrifice for their group, and then knowing they can expect that from the same, they can expect the same from their group, the same kind of loyalty and sacrifice, as opposed to an individualistic culture in which the idea is that you are to be responsible for your own needs and those of perhaps immediate family members. So Russia's high score on power distance and low score on individualism has a practical implication for business in Russia, which is that there is no separation between business and personal relationships. They are not going to do business with people with whom they do not feel a personal connection or a personal level of trust. So you have to establish this personal relationship, show that you are trustworthy before you can do business. This is going to shift your timeline quite a bit, putting relationship building first and then moving on to the business 
portion at hand. So this would be the opposite for someone from my culture in the US where you handle the tasks first. And then if there is some kind of personal connection, you can follow up on that later, but they're separate things. Um, so in Russia, if you're used to, like me, starting with the task and then moving to the relationship, you're going to have to flip that if you want to establish that trust and be successful in their market. So Russia has a low score on masculinity, making it what we call a feminine country. And again, this doesn't refer to um, people's behavior in terms of how, whether they're a masculine person or a feminine person, but on this dimension, it talks about what the motivation is as you engage in society. So in a low masculinity score, which indicates high femininity, and I'm sorry if these terms are confusing, but we can talk about them later again if, the, if you need more explanation, means that the society cares for its people and caring for one another is a more important motivator than competing with one another for success and achievement. So compassion in the workplace is important, caring in the workplace is important, and these things are going to be traits that a manager will need to show for the subordinates so that they feel safe and cared for in the work environment, and then they will in turn provide good work and service to the manager. So if you're working across this Russian cultural border, they will want to know and feel that you are invested in them personally and are willing to take time to get to know them and that you care about their quality of life and how they're doing just as much as you care about their work. In turn, you will get very good work back. Rewarding teams and rewarding good work is appropriate, but with this low masculinity score, modesty is also a very important trait in the workplace. So singling out an individual and saying they did a better job than anyone else is going to be very culturally uncomfortable for that person rewarding a team and saying what a great job the team did is going to be a great way to provide incentive, to encourage, and to motivate workers. So when we come to uncertainty avoidance, as I showed you on the scores before, Russia has one of the highest uncertainty avoidance scores. This means that Russians, um, as a national culture, want to know what's coming. They want to have a system in place that helps them know what to expect and is what we refer to sometimes as an anxious country. So in cultures with a high uncertainty avoidance score, we're going to find heavy bureaucratic practices in place so that each step is controlled so that expectations are clear. Now we'll find that often in Russia, the expectations can shift as you go along, but the high uncertainty avoidance does indicate that you will have some pretty complicated bureaucracy to move through. Um, it's another reason that you need to establish trust so that your Russian counterparts can help you through the bureaucratic process which they're very good at managing and can be heavy and unwieldy for people that are coming from a low uncertainty avoidance culture where this kind of level of bureaucracy is not common. Because as Pia will explain later, there are lots of ways around specific bureaucratic um, needs, we'll call them. And long-term orientation and indulgence. Russia has a very high score for long-term orientation and a low score for indulgence. And when we look at these together, we see that Russians are going to make decisions with a long-term view and in return are willing to sacrifice personal comforts and 
time in order to achieve those goals. This is different from the United States, which has a very low long-term orientation score. So it's more of a live in the moment culture and very high indulgence score. So it's very much live in the moment, enjoy your time. Um, Russians are going to take a long view and they are going to be willing to let go of some personal comforts and indulgences in order to achieve their goals. So in working with Russians, and one thing that comes out of this collectivist, high uncertainty avoidance culture is this idea of quid pro quo. So the exchange of favors. Um, Russian business has a lot of favor swapping. Some of this is to help with the bureaucracy. Um, some of it is to build trust. And so be prepared that you may be asked for favors um, and understand that you are also allowed to ask for help with things and they are happy to reciprocate. So it's not, it's not just trying to get things, it's establishing, again, this personal relationship that supersedes business that says, you help me and I will be helpful to you as well. You will be presented with heavy bureaucracy, but suggestions from your Russian partners on how to manage it. Um, some of these solutions may not be solutions that you're used to in your own country. Sometimes it may seem like cutting corners to you, but understand that um, you have a lot of experience working with the bureaucracy and be open to hearing their solutions. Expect negotiations to be recursive, ongoing, and ever developing. Invest in personal relationships, as we said before. Gift giving is important. It's not considered bribery. It's considered part of the establishment of trust and part of the development of this in-group relationship. And you have to respect the hierarchy. So if you come from a very egalitarian country with a low power distance score like Pia does and like I do, we're very comfortable asking anyone in the hierarchy for advice about something. In a culture with a very high power distance score, this is going to be inappropriate. It will make the subordinate feel uncomfortable because you're going not to the decision maker, you're going lower. It will make the manager uncomfortable because they may feel that they're being cut out of the process. So if they show you what the hierarchy is, you do need to respect their decision-making process and that it goes from the top to the bottom. So if we go back to the case studies, the first one is about the managing director of a small European enterprise, and they've been asked to go to Russia and they want an order first because they don't want to invest the money in a trip unless they know that there is going to be income coming from that relationship. Pia, how would you advise this managing director in this situation so that they can be successful with their Russian business? <clears throat> uh, I would advise him to take into the account that now we are talking about a collectivistic culture where the requirement is personal trust. And uh, in Russia, it means that business is done with friends, usually. So you have to remember this trust aspect here, how they create trust in, how do you create trust in Russia? You have to have the personal relationship with the decision making. If you, they are not liable to you anyhow, or you will never have a very good business if you haven't met them a couple of times. So I would say go. Of course, I understand that uh, sometimes for SMEs, the problem is the costs. Can you justify the cost? In many SMEs, uh, <clears throat> the thing is that the thinking is in the individualistic countries that, okay, if you go somewhere, will you come with an order or something like that? So you bring the order in. But it doesn't happen like that in collectivistic countries. You don't just go and get an order. You actually have to 
build the trust and the relationship first, and then the order follows. So I don't know if you don't have too much money, then you have to maybe you could actually organize some other meetings to, to save unit costs of meeting or something like this. But I would still advise you to go. One thing that you mentioned yesterday as you and I were discussing this case study is that there are a lot of companies interested in doing business in Moscow. So the mm -hmm. business that comes and visits will have an advantage. Would you say that's correct? It's correct. Because how the Russians see the world, they see that everybody, everybody wants, from everywhere in the world wants to make business with us. That's how they see it. And then if they invite you to come over, they are like, why? Why don't they come? Don't, don't they really want to make serious business? Right. So I'm thinking. Again, relationship, show your dedication to the business before you're going to be able to do business in the Western sense. Right. <clears throat> okay. So the Swedish boss briefly meets a staff member and asks her to take on a project in an informal moment. And the staff member promises to do it. The next time they meet, almost nothing has been done. What could be the reason? So in a Swedish work environment that's very egalitarian, so low power distance, very individualist, it is expected that a boss can ask a subordinate to take on a project. And if the subordinate says that they will, the idea is that the subordinate will then take the initiative to develop the project with very little guidance or coaching. And then when they meet, they'll discuss it and adjust from there. In a country like Russia with high power distance and high collectivism and high uncertainty avoidance, the manager is expected to give very explicit instructions, very close guidance, so that the subordinate knows exactly what is expected of them from the outset. So in this situation, my interpretation from the dimensions is that the Russian staff member did not understand yet what was expected of them and perhaps did not take the cue from the Swedish boss that they were supposed to already begin. The Russian staff member was likely waiting for instruction on how to begin, what the timeline might be, and waiting for more input from the manager. In a high PDI culture, the manager is supposed to be invested in every step of the development of a project. So if that's absent, it may be that the staff member is not sure how to proceed. So in this case, the best, situ the best thing to do is for the boss to say, I'd like you to take on this project. Let me speak with you later about what I'm thinking about this project, how I would like you to proceed, and let's talk about some of the details before you begin. And in that way, the Russian staff member will understand the expectations and begin work on the project. All right. I also wanted to add that actually what the Russian uh, manager might also be thinking is that if the Swedish boss is not my direct boss, is it the right, should I do it or not? Because my direct boss didn't give me this task. Right. So that's also one thing to add. Right, another example of power distance affecting how projects move along. Right. I'll turn it back over to Pia for some practical advice on how one goes about establishing meetings and negotiating in the Russian business context. Okay, thanks Lisa. All right, so you want to start negotiations with a company you have identified as a potential partner. And if you've done it right, you have checked their background, that uh, there is the basic trustworthiness in that company. Because Russians are used to checking, checking backgrounds, like we talked before about the trust. So they don't trust before checking. And uh, here, here we actually took uh, the 
sales uh, process framework for us. It's the same framework that our uh, colleagues, uh, Mark Jacobs and Jean-Pierre Cohen, use in their very good book, Negotiating Like a Local. It's just a common sales framework to help you to, to go through the sales process uh, with the Russians, which usually is not this linear, but still, it's a good framework. Also, um, Pia and I have created a slide at the very end of this presentation with a link to where you can find um, Mark and Jean-Pierre's book and where you can find some other resources on the Hofstede website that will also help you as you go forward. Pia? Okay, thanks. All right, so we are in this collectivistic uh, country, Russia. Uh, there are two ways of setting the meetings, the shorter way and the longer way. If you have the personal contact, almost any personal contact, you can ask introductions. You can ask your partners from even different businesses that, do you know anybody in this business and can you help me to find somebody to talk about this, this business, for example. So uh, if you get recommendations from people, uh, from important people, let's say so, they make you, they guarantee you, they say that you are trustworthy. You are worth meeting, you are important as well. So it's a good start to get to uh, go to the meeting. And uh, also you have to remember these reciprocal favors. It is, in this culture, it's one's obligation to help open doors for contacts and uh, organize in -group for your in-group members when possible. And uh, also you have to remember that important people don't meet just anybody because of the high, high PDI. So you also have to be important. And if you have uh, connections that can guarantee that you are important, then it's easier to get in. Okay, of course it's not possible always. Probably nobody knows, nobody of your contacts knows uh, or get, has contacts in, in the uh, companies that you would like to meet with. So then you just need to do the ordinary way. So what it usually means is that you have to send the so-called official letters. That's how the Russians call them. Preference, preferably uh, you have a round seal. They are stamped, signed by your top manage, management and usually it's beneficial to have a so-called outgoing number for that letter. It makes it official. And then when you are calling afterwards, if they have received your letter, you can say, okay, it is this and this outgoing number. It's this old, I don't know if it's an old Soviet system, but still it works in many places. So remember that. But uh, of course, in real life, you need several calls and letters and introductory material sent to the decision make maker so that the gatekeeper will get you through. So actually there is some kind of bureaucracy to go through, but if you're patient, you will in the end get through. It just takes some time. Well, then the next question is that who should, who should uh, meet and who should go? Because uh, Actually, you have to aim high to the top management level. You have to remember that in the uh, high PDI culture, like Russia, lower level managers don't make any decisions. I know that us Finns, we have made so many mistakes in this. We have, you know, banged our head, heads <laughs> against the wall because we have tri tried to go through lower levels. Of course, it can sometimes be beneficial to go go uh, from different levels, but still uh, you have to remember that it's always the top management who makes real decisions in the company. And like I said earlier, important people only meet important people, so it's also beneficial for you to send the same level negotiator. And if you do that already in your letter, you say that our general manager will be in Moscow and this and this uh, period of time, we would like to meet you. It's better than you just say that somebody from our company would like to do that. The higher 
in the hierarchy, the better. Okay. Then you also have to remember that you will, you will be met by the management and a team of experts. Russians are usually in groups. So it's also wise for you not to go alone. At least, I would advise at least two persons. One can make notes, comment on something. Maybe, maybe one of your team knows more about uh, uh, technological aspects or technical things. One is more on the commercial side, etc. But it's really uh, difficult if just one person from your company is trying to solve everything in place when there are like five or six people on the other side of the table. Then uh, about some practical issues, how to dress for business meetings. This is the question everybody wants to know usually. So I advise that formality stays in first meetings. So wear a suit or a smart casual jacket and trousers if you're a man. And uh, also uh, Russians like some status symbols. So if you have a smart watch, you have polished shoes, Russians also look at your shoes for some reason. It's very important that they are polished. <laughs> yes. Do not yeah. go with dirty shoes. Yes. Yeah. And uh, if you're a woman, dress or suit. And also Russians usually have very good makeup, hairdo, also polished shoes. So they really take care of their appearance. But in later meetings, they are usually, they can be more relaxed. So you maybe you just check how the counterpart is dressed. But uh, for the first meetings, I would advise you to be quite formal in your dressing. And like we said, formal. Also, you should expect formal behavior in first meetings. So in Russia, actually, it means don't smile so much. Because in our many, many other cultures in the world, like we have in the West, Smiling is a sign of uh, being polite, but in Russian it's not. Actually, if you meet for the first time and you smile a lot, like Lisa, you know the American smile, yes, <laughs> showing your teeth. The Russians call very it the American in Russia. Um, so yeah, the Russians call it the American cheese. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It might uh, make you look a little bit suspicious, like. What kind of feelings are you hiding behind you? And uh, if you, you have to be quite formal also to show that you take it seriously. So you have to have a serious look on your face. But then, again, when you go get to the personal relationship, uh, you, you get also less formal. So when, as Russians usually smile to friends, not to strangers, you will know when you have become friends. You get more smiles, more friendly looks. Okay. Uh, in Russia, yes, you have to have a firm handshake. You have to look the person in the eyes when you are saying hi. And uh, what is um, a little bit peculiar for many Western people is that women don't usually shake hands in Russia. But if you're a woman, you can offer a hand first. It's, it's just fine and they will take it. Sometimes they get confused and they, for example, kiss it or something. But it, it has happened to me a couple of times. <laughs> and uh, how you address your interlocutor, it's like Mr. Gaspadin Ivano or Mrs. Ivanova. Or you can call them first name plus patronymic, which is the, actually comes from the father's name. So it, it can be Vera Sergeyevna, Vladimir Sergeyevich. And then you say we, which is the polite you, instead of just you, which is we. And uh, actually, the, it's, the, it's easier to explain it in, in German. So we is Z, for all of you who know German. And in the subsequent meetings, how you greet, it's more like handshakes or also kisses on the cheeks and hugs. But then you have a good relationship already. Yeah, like. if, if I can add something, the kisses on the cheeks in Russia are not like the kisses on the cheeks in France where you just touch cheeks. 
It's actually kisses. So don't be shocked or <laughs> taken aback. It's very normal if it's an actual kiss on each cheek. So. Okay, yeah, thanks, Lisa. Okay, so in Russia, of course, you want to, in the beginning of the meetings, you want to create a positive atmosphere. So the small talk is quite commonly, it's like, okay, traffic jams, then you should probably give some compliments about the city, how nice it looks like, or what kind of imp nice impressions you've had. The weather is safe always. The Russians also, they like sports, hobbies, it's safe to talk about them. And also Russians talk quite a lot of, about their families, but not in the first meeting probably, but probably the first meeting is more about the city impressions and traffic jams and weather. So, But later on, these, these are safe subjects. And then when you, in the process, when you go to identifying needs, so, when you are sitting at the meeting table, probably, uh, first of all, uh, you both parties introduce themselves, exchange company information, and it doesn't really matter who starts, but you can start if you're active. And if you, if you start it, then the Russians in their turn usually say what they want, why they are interested in your offer, and why they accept it, accepted the meeting. And then you go to dialogue. You can ask questions about the needs in more details and of course lead the discussion in your direction and they usually will be happy to answer. And in the end they will ask, can you offer us something for our problems if you haven't told it clear before, if you have somehow gone around the subject. And then you go into a deeper presentation of your product or service. This is just very common stuff. But uh, then when you go to present your commercial proposal, um, I think it's really important to understand that in a high uh, uncertainty avoidance culture, the proposal needs to be thorough. It needs to include technical details in addition to commercial and partnership related advantages. And you have to be prepared to very detailed, sometimes in your opinion, irrelevant questions. Russians like to interrupt and ask a lot. So be prepared for interruptions and not proceeding in the right order because these interruptions are a sign of interest. In Finland, we have a com uh, our, our communication style is very different. Everybody has their turns. And this, this is very difficult for the Finns when you're interrupted all the time. But uh, it's, it's not disrespectful. Dis dis Full. <laughs> Sorry for my English. Okay, and then uh, also you should avoid excessive marketing talk and stick to the facts and you shouldn't brag. This is the feminine culture of things. So you are not supposed to kind of over, over talk or give some expressions that are like great and wonderful and things like this. Russians don't like them. So be very realistic in what you tell. When you get to the uh, stage of uh, giving the Russians a written quotation or offer, remember that it also must be very detailed because um, I have so many experiences from real life that the Russians really will later refer to every written detail during the business deal. If, if, if uh, the deal is somehow unfavorable to them, then they will look at the paper very carefully and find the facts there. And if something, something is not written there, then they, of course, interpret it to their favor. Yes, this must be included in the price, etc. So being too abstract means problems. Right. Then when we go to negotiating the price, you can really e expect very different kinds of negotiation styles. The better you have uh, created the relationship with the counterpart, the nicer negotiations you have. But if you don't have 
re relationships you there are there are companies who still have this kind of soviet army style negotiation they are they are giving you very hard requirements they are bluffing they are doing dirty tricks but you can encounter this but you don't have to expect this because there are so many different approaches but in russia you also have to remember that if somebody says no to your price it can be just a starting point for further negotiations. So in Russia, people think that everything is negotiable. And uh, for example, if you have already, they have agreed to buy a non-preferable um, priced, priced uh, product from you, then you can expect the next, next negotiations in some time for sure. So they, ha they don't have the, a kind of thinking that contract is the or deal is a deal you agreed so you have to stick to it no they don't do it if it's not favorable them then they will just continue uh, they lift up the same questions again even though you have written a contract okay but how do you know that you're closing the deal in a, in russia which is the relationship uh, culture it actually it's a kind of a smooth process they said, okay, we will send you our draft of the contract, or please send your draft of contract to us. This means that you are very far in this. And remember that the contract, according to Russian legislation, has to be bilingual. So Russian, English, quite usually. And uh, what happens next after this? You will start working on operational issues before the signing. There is a lot of Russian bureaucracy that Lisa mentioned in documentations. It's the certifications you might need for your products to be imported and so resold in Russia. It's pro forma invoice, it's invoice forms, it's uh, packing list products and package labeling, etc. Everything has to be strictly according to the Russian legislation. So usually you have a lot of work to do at this stage. When you are there, uh, then the next stage is contract signing. So again, you, have, you should have the round seal with company registration number. That's my advice. It's not obligatory anymore according to the Russian legislation, but everybody is using it, so it's still a habit, and they will ask for it. And then again, remember that you're in this never-ending negotiate, negotiations. So it's continuing. And as a conclusion, I would like to say that your negotiation success depends, on, of course, on your offering, your conditions, your product, etc., the complexity. But even more, it depends on your ability to build personal trust and relationship. It always comes first. So to conclude this, I think this is the this is a good thing to say. Business is never just business in Russia. All right. Then then we uh, th then we would be happy to hear your questions or pretend questions I guess or Celia can you help us? Yes. Uh, if you want to ask questions, you can type them in the chat window that is on the right side of your screen. There is so many people connected today, if we would uh, unmute you, then uh, we wouldn't be able to hear anyone. One thing that P and I have each experienced in Russia as a result of 
high PDI that we have discussed that might also be another example of how some of this works is that if you are in Russia and visiting and you are perceived as an important person, you may be asked to do things that you don't expect. Um, I have been asked to give a speech before in a meeting where I didn't know I would be a featured speaker. Tia has been interviewed by the press in Kazakhstan and made it on the national news. So um, the relationship component and the power distance component can lead to some exciting adventures when you are doing business in Russia. All right, yeah, I have, I have had a couple of times the same situation that I've been asked, asked to give an interview for a TV. And actually in Russia, somebody asks for an interview and then puts the micro, micro, uh, microphone in front of you, uh, you expect to hear some questions. But this, is not, this hasn't been the case. The case has been that they say, talk. And you're like, okay, sorry, I wasn't prepared for this. And uh, when I had the first, I made the mistake the first time when I was, I think it, it was in Omsk in Siberia when I had this thing. But then the next time it was in Kazakhstan, in Karaganda. And there I already knew that this is going to happen. And uh, I decided then that I have to ask um my partners there what do you want me to tell in uh, for the, for the tv and actually uh they said something that i would never have guessed or i should have as be uh, thinking that i'm culturally savvy but i didn't so i i thought it was safe to ask and they said that you should uh, actually compliment us and this whole event um and uh, thank the president Nazarbayev for uh, organizing and giving this kind of uh, possibilities for for us to organize these events. So somehow link it to the president. So I that would never happen in Finland or the U.S. I think <laughs> um, that leads us to some of the questions that are here. The first one is, what is the number one issue you have had in Russia? For me, as a person coming from the U.S. culture, um, which has very high, very high individualist score, um, it's the power distance adjusting to this idea that um, there is a hierarchy that you have to go through in every situation. You can't just talk to anyone. You have to understand who has power in which situation and how to appropriate, how to approach them well, and um, perhaps what levels you need to go through. Um, Pia, another question is, is it safe for me to go to Russia as a female alone to negotiate? How would you answer that? I would say it is safe. You can go, it's fine. but. But uh, I would also advise you to have with you maybe somebody local who knows Russian. Because in many places, even in Moscow, like if you, if you don't know any Russian, it's hard for you even to, you know, find your set, way out from the airport. Because most uh, signs are written in the Cyrillic letters. And then there are all those taxi drivers who come and try to uh, in a way, ro rob you or get get a very good price from you and stuff like that. So, but otherwise, to negotiate, it's totally safe, no problem. Another question that we've had is, um, you mentioned visiting Russia personally in the beginning. Is it enough to do it in the beginning, or should one prepare to keep visiting in the future as well? I would say you should prepare to keep visiting in the future um, after you've established the initial relationship. You can ask them to visit you um, so that it's not always you just being the one doing the traveling, but you should plan on having multiple meetings over the relationship. Um, and I would also, mm -hmm. go ahead, Tia. Yeah, I, I would like to um, add here that uh, my experience is that when you meet your partners regularly, you get information about the market 
about your, for example, your distributor, how they are doing, how they are selling, how, how they are selling your products, what kind of uh, estimations they have for the futures. They don't usually send this information to you by email. But when you go there, they will tell you. So that's why it's also very beneficial to meet often. And that actually leads us to this next question. How do you deal with the bureaucracy? It seems to me that things will never end. And when do we know if we're wasting our time? This is where building the relationship comes in. So if you have a really good working relationship with your Russian team, they will help you with the bureaucracy. They know ways around certain parts of the bureaucracy. They know which pieces of the bureaucratic process can't be skipped. And if they're showing a lot of interest in exchanging drafts of contracts, then you know you're not wasting your time. Um, and the last question here, is the ability to speak the language important? I would say you need to, if you don't speak the language yourself, you definitely need to have a translator help you um, because they do want to see that you are interested in their culture and language. And as Pia said, the documentation has to be bilingual. So you're going to need to work with a translator um, at some point. So it's probably good to start from the beginning. Um, Russians, a lot of them do speak very good English and other languages. But at some point, a translator will probably have to be brought on board. And any effort you make in speaking some Russian or learning some phrases, showing interest in the culture will be very appreciated. Did you have anything you want to add to the bureaucracy or uh, language issues, Pia? Uh, for the language issue, I would like to add that actually, when you are hiring a translator or somebody with a very good Russian skills, it's, it's better to have your own person there. Because if you rely on the, uh, your counterpart's translator, sometimes it's very biased what they are doing. So it's better to have somebody who is on your side as well. That's all the questions in the chat window. Are there any more? Actually, I would also like to say about the bureaucracy. There is a certain bureaucracy that you can't avoid. You just have to do it. So be patient and do what all the documentation, for example, that you, that you need to do. When you have done like pro forma invoices, invoices, packing lists, and all those things in the needed way, then they are done and they are there for the future. But the initial time investment in this is quite big. Hey, if there aren't any other questions, we'll just put this slide up that has some additional resources. You can check out some of these are from the Hofstede um, Insights website some articles written by Pia about business in Russia and a link to the book Negotiate Like a Local, um, which was written by some of our partners. And um, we thank you very much for joining us today. And um, please reach out to Hofstede if you have any additional questions. Misha and Pia, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, you will be available to answer a few questions in the forum. So if you have any questions, you can go to the Cubin platform and your questions will be answered. I would like to share that the next webinar, is your organization ready to go international, is next week on Tuesday. You can still register on the Cubin platform. Thank you so much for joining. And we'll see you next week. Thank you.